Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 79, I chat with home theater editor Rob Sabin and senior editor Tom Norton about the Cedia trade show we all just came back from. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded September 12th, 2011, episode 79. Cedia Wrap Up. This episode of Home Theater Geeks is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Hey there, I'm Scott Wilkinson, uh, online editor of HomeTheater.com, and my guest geeks today are editor Rob Sabin of Home Theater Magazine and senior editor Tom Norton of Home Theater Magazine and HomeTheater.com. We've just gotten back from the Cedia Trade Show, Custom Electronics Design and Installation Association, where we saw a ton of cool stuff that we're going to tell you all about in the next hour. Hey guys, welcome to the show. Hey Scott. Hey Scott, how are you? I'm great, thanks. Um, a little tired still. We just uh, flew back yeah. yesterday, and uh, and boy, our uh, arms are tired. <laughs> and boy, our arms are tired. Yes, exactly right. Uh, Rob, no, no problem for you, time wise. You're you're on the East Coast anyway. But uh, Tom and I uh, got up mighty early this morning through no fault or desire like of our own. Yeah. yeah oh. Yep. 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 Well, you know, you know what I experience now when I come out to work on the magazine. I have the same exactly. issue going back. So. Exactly. Exactly. And you come out one week a month. Good God, that's that must be brutal. That's yeah, it's it. Well, yeah, I love being out there. I tell you what, there's uh, something to be said for your weather in California. <laughs> yeah, I can't agree with you more there. That's for sure. Uh, those who are tuned in to the live video stream at uh, live.twit.tv or uh, logged into the chat room at irc.twit.tv can post questions for us as we talk about the show, and uh, I'll certainly pass along as many as I can. So um, we had the show was shorter by one day this year, which uh, a lot of the manufacturers I talked to thought was a good idea. I didn't uh, because it didn't give us enough time to cover as much of the show. What do you guys think? Yeah, I prefer the four-day, because it's only been a couple of years since they've been doing four-day. CD always used to be a three-day show, and I guess they decided to go back to their roots. Hmm. Rob, how would you yeah, feel about it? Oh, I definitely could have used an extra day for sure. You know, what, what happens is as you start to walk around the floor, you know, you hit all the big guys first because you know yeah. that they've got some major stuff going on. But the real fun of the show is going around and finding those little discoveries at the tiny booths yeah. and the people who have technology you never heard of before. So uh, exactly. I think we were a little... Yeah, we were a little short on that time this time. Yeah, I did find a couple of a little of those little guys that I thought were really interesting, and I'm sure you guys did too. Um, so let's get into it. Uh, what we saw at the show. I'll start with <clears throat> video. Uh, basically, we'll talk about video and audio, maybe a little custom stuff. But um, I think probably the biggest story of the show, video-wise, was the introduction of the Sharp Elite. Uh, LCD flat panel, which wasn't being shown in the Sharp booth since Sharp didn't have a booth, <laughs> but it was in the Pioneer booth because Sharp had licensed the name Elite to put on this new LCD flat panel, um, which they in fact developed in collaboration with uh, the Pioneer engineers who had worked on the Kuro Plasma, which we all uh, love and lament its loss. Um, Tom, I know you saw it. Rob, did you, right. did you get a chance oh, yes. to get in there and oh. see it? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. What, yeah. What'd you think? And, I, thought uh, it was, with, yeah, I thought it was terrific. Go ahead, Rob. Yeah, without a doubt, I think the very best uh, video flat panel display we've seen to date, probably better than the Kuro, although we'd have to take a look and see what it looks like alongside. <laughs> uh, but certainly uh, a, a quantum leap over any of the LCD panels that we've seen. And uh, without a doubt, the talk of the show. I mean, it was just a spectacular TV. You didn't need more, I don't think, than, than five minutes to know that you were looking at something very special there. What, what did you think, Tom? 
Oh yeah, I thought it was terrific. I, I would, I would, I would append a comment to the fact that Sharp worked together with pioneer engineers on the panel. And I'm sure there were some pioneer engineers involved, but some 250 of the core engineers are now working for Panasonic. So uh, we should. Well, that's we, true. We should preface it with that. So yeah, I'm sure that's there were true. Some left. <laughs> there probably were some left, and I, yeah. I, I do know. I mean, the pioneer told us that that, mm -hmm. that they had worked with Sharp to mm -hmm. um, get the black levels down and to get the uh, processing to the point. Um, where where it was and it's just it i agree it was just absolutely spectacular um <clears throat> the really good news is that tom you're going to get the 60 inch it comes in a 60 and a 70 inch mm, yep. version and you're going to get the 60 inch and you're going to be able to put it right next to your 60 inch curl plasma that's right that's correct yeah I, I got a little bit i was i was doing some calculations this morning and not to uh you remember my propeller head here. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, we, we were told by a pioneer representative that uh, we, we asked how many, uh, uh, for the readers that aren't familiar, that, that this particular set is, uh, is a, we should mention, of course, that it's an LCD and it's a local dimming LCD. which right. uh, has, we, has uh, LEDs, yeah. LED yes. backlighting with local LED dimming. LED backlight with full local dimming. Uh, I won't go into that in great amount of detail. We discuss that a lot in the book, uh, in the magazine. But... Uh, most manufacturers are fairly reluctant to tell you how many zones of dimming they have behind the screen, mm -hmm. and uh, we did hear, we did hear from a Pioneer uh, rep uh, uh, at the last day of the show that uh, that apparently they had they had let the cat out of the bag to their dealers, and he said, well, I don't have any reason to know why I shouldn't tell you. So he told us that. Uh, well, go ahead. And go ahead I'm going to go ahead and say it that the 60-inch set has uh, has uh, 240 zones, and according to what he said, and the 70-inch set has 336 zones. And I did some calculations uh, for, for the other propeller heads in the group. Uh, <laughs> a 60-inch, uh, each zone is six, because of the area of the screen, is 6.38 square inches. Mm. For a 70-inch set, each zone is 6.12 square inches, which doesn't sound a whole lot different. But when you look at it on a pixel basis, and uh, it doesn't seem logical that it should come out this way, but it did. I mean... You know, again, uh, with with uh, with our jet lag, maybe my maybe my math is off a little bit, but the sixty inch <laughs> the sixty inch screen uh, with two million pixels roughly on the screen, the sixty inch screen, uh, each zone uh, has to cover eight thousand six hundred and forty pixels. Huh. On the seventy inch on the seventy inch inch set, each zone only has to cover six thousand one hundred and seventy one pixels. So I'm wondering if the seventy inch might be a little bit better than the than the sixty, which they were not showing. By the way, they were only showing the seventy, and they had the sixty on but turned off, so you could see how dark the total blacks were. Mm -hmm. So now, that's, just, either, that's just an observation. <laughs> either way, though, either yeah. way, each yep. dimming zone yep. encompasses a lot of pixels. Oh yeah, yeah. Which yep. is the problem? Which is which? Right, gives rise to the problem of mm -hmm. what we call haloing. So if you have yep. a star field, uh, bright yep. stars on a black yep. background, or yep. uh, scrolling white letters in a in the um, end credits of a movie on a black background, mm -hmm. you um, typically with local dimmers get uh, halos around these tiny bright things because the dimming zone is so much larger than individual pixels or even these small yep. objects. And yet we saw no haloing on this set. Yep. Well, I wouldn't say we saw none. I, I saw what might have been some, but no worse than the kind of... Uh, you get a little bit of haloing even on a plasma because reflections off the inside of the glass. Well, uh, I suppose that's front true. Glass. So that may be the same issue I'm talking about. I'm saying when we're talking about we saw no haloing, we, saw not, we did not see the kind of haloing we usually see on backlit local dimming sets. I'd yeah. say that. Uh, Rob, did you uh, did you notice that same thing? Yes, exactly the same thing. And in fact, I was going to comment on the fact that certainly this, the uh, the smaller of the two TVs, uh, which Tom was indicating, might be the one that has the greater problem with the haloing. Didn't seem to be exhibiting uh, virtually any at all. Uh, now you can't really tell until you get on there with some program material that you like, such as a star field. They weren't showing us any of those. Yeah. Well, but, but they, they were showing they were showing fireworks. They did, and they also showed some interesting uh, sort of, uh, you know, lit up street lamps and things like that to kind of show the effect of the circuitry. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot going on in that TV that I think is very cutting edge, both in mm -hmm. terms of the processing as well as the fact yeah. that they seem to be very effectively using uh, yeah. that LED array back there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when, yeah. You, when, you were, when you were watching it, Rob, did they have both the 60 and the 70 fired up? Were they actually no, they running an image they, on both? Okay. No, they didn't, the they 70. showed me just like just like you guys. They sort of showed yep. you uh, the fact that it could be black yep. when when it's yep. off or when it gets yep. a zero IRE. One yep. of the things I did look at and ask them to kind of show for me. They didn't really have any test patterns they could throw up, yep. but 
Uh, you know, Tom, we're always talking in the magazine, and you're always talking in your reviews about how uh, when you have these uh, backlit uh, local dimming sets, there's a tendency when they get a zero IRE signal to kind of drop down to black, but in, in not a particularly smooth way. And um, this particular TV, I was watching very carefully the transitions uh, on a video clip that they showed. It was a trailer for uh, some movie. And uh, there were a lot of cuts in that where it kind of went to black. And I, I was not able to detect uh, any, mm -hmm. any kind of heaving of the image or anything that might normally suggest to you that, that those, those LEDs weren't responding just super, super fast to the signal. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and, yeah, and that, I, right. Well, one I thing totally we, should, we, should, we should mention for sure that, that uh, most people, some people aren't, people aren't aware of, for those that are thinking sharp slash pioneer slash elite, is that apparently, at least according to the pioneer folks, this is a completely new panel. It's not the panel that are used on the current sharp sets. I mean, it may find its way into sharp sets in the future, but this is a unique panel to the, to the elite right now. That's right. In fact, uh, my posting up about this particular uh, flat panel, which for those who are joining us late, we're talking about the sharp elite uh, LCD flat panels that were shown at Cedia uh, for the first time and just are essentially the return of Kuro uh, in, in LCD. Uh, one guy wrote in and said, oh, these are the same thing as the Sharp 835 and 735 just with a, an elite brand name and twice the price, uh, which they aren't. I can, I can tell you for sure they aren't. And speaking of price, that's, that's the kicker, isn't it? Just that's like the, the Kuro. That's the killer. <laughs> <laughs> Just like the Kuro was so expensive, these sets are really expensive. Um, the 60, I think, is 5,500 bucks list. Is that right? That's, that's what my understanding is, yes. Uh -huh. and, the, and the 70 inch is $8,000. Yeah. My big concern with, that, with those price points is that uh, it, it strikes me that it was those price points that kind of chased uh, Pioneer out of the, the market in the first place. You know, you exactly. hope that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I will tell you, you know, I had a little bit of an offline discussion with uh, some of the people at the Pioneer booth uh, who were showing the sets, and uh, they indicated that there didn't seem to be any shortage at all of custom installers who not only uh, were very hungry for the TV, but felt that they could sell these in great quantities. And uh, there, there will always be that segment of the market. Um, I think the Well, true, and especially at Cedia, which is a pretty right. high-end show. Absolutely. And it's, you know, that's the custom installer show. The real question mm -hmm. becomes, can they generate the kind of volume that they need to be able to, this is, this is a TV that, if you believe what, uh, what, the, what the elite, quote unquote, brand people were talking about, uh, yeah. this is a television that was created with a no holds barred uh, philosophy. They basically took all these engineers, stuck them in a room and said, just make us the best TV that you can and then we'll figure out what we have to price it at. Um, mm. The real question becomes, can they produce it in quantities that are cheap enough to, to where if they need to lower the price later because the initial top of that pyramid, you know, has already bought the set, yeah. uh, can they get it down low enough to where they can keep it going? The one thing I'm encouraged about is it is, after all, an LCD TV, and that is in some ways less manufacturing intensive than, than a, a plasma is. On the other hand, mm -hmm. you know, these full array LED sets have been among the most expensive on the market so far. So That's knows? right. And, they're all, and they are still going to suffer from the off-axis problem, which all LCDs yeah. do to one degree or another. Now, these, I went way off-axis. And by the way, someone asked in the chat room if, if we were looking at them in a darkened room, and we were. were. They were able to turn the lights totally out. It was a totally black room. Well, almost totally. Almost. <laughs> and... Um, they had some signage uh, you know, on that was... Bright. They had a little, little lighted signs on, yeah. But generally speaking... And, uh, you know, going way off axis, yes, you could see that the image degraded somewhat, but not nearly as much, I thought, than most LCDs I've seen, even expensive uh, local dimmers. And you I went far, farther off axis than most people would ever sit to watch a TV. Exactly. I went just about 180 <laughs> degrees because I just wanted yeah. to see what the maximum mm -hmm. uh, might be. Um, somebody else in the chat room here, uh, forgetful, is uh, asking, with, is this with the yellow pixel? And the answer is yes. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> uh, Sharp, uh, Sharp has added the yellow pixel to this. They're not calling it Quatron in this case, interestingly. Yeah. They're, they're calling it uh, RGB plus Y. Now, why they yeah. changed the name, I don't really know. I'm hoping they bring back George Takei to advertise it's the thing. Oh, my set, yeah. <laughs> oh, so, okay. uh, I can add a couple of things, too, to this discussion about the set, because, of course, you mentioned uh, the, the fourth pixel. So one of the things that uh, 
that, that our listeners should know is that THX uh, is taking some credit for having been uh, fairly heavily involved in not so much the development of it, but in making sure that the quality standards were right. According to the contact uh, that we have over at THX, they, they sent the TV back a whole bunch of times mm -hmm. to get oh, them Oh, really? To fix I hadn't things. heard that. Interesting. Yes, that was, uh, and, and I think you know who told me that uh, at the show, because he's our primary contact over there. But um, the, uh, so that I found very interesting that THX was involved in. But one of the rumors that has been floating around about this TV that I believe I can dispel because I was there in the demo room at the time they were able to figure it out, was whether or not the yellow pixel on this TV is actually turned on in the THX mode. There seemed to be some stuff uh, on the chatter lines about the fact that when you put the set into THX mode, it actually turns off that fourth yellow pixel. Uh, well, that's I was interesting. Actually, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure where that came from, but I will tell you this much. I was actually in the room uh, with Pioneer uh, um, personnel when they had a loop out looking at the set to be certain what was on and what was off when they turned it into the THX mode. The answer is yes, the yellow pixel is on in THX mode. They're using it's on the in THX for the mode. pixels. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So Well that I would be really surprised if they turned off the yellow pixel in THX <laughs> mode because I mean you would be robbing the set of a lot of brightness if you did that. You would think, and why would you really? But, uh, you know, you get these people who come up with these wacky ideas. So. Yeah, it's true. It's <laughs> true. Um, uh, let's see. What was, oh, I was going to say also the yellow pixel, uh, as long as it isn't taking the color of yellow outside of the boundaries of where it's supposed to be, uh, I'm fine with it because the way they explained it in the demo I saw was the yellow pixel adds brightness. Yellow is a uh, probably the brightest of the six colors. Uh, Tom, correct me if I'm wrong. If, if it's not cyan, it's certainly yellow. It's pretty close, yeah. yeah. It, they're close it anyway. Be, yeah. And so if you add a yellow pixel, you're going to add brightness uh, to oh, the I think image. it would be the brightest because, because you know, the blue, which is, you know, cyan is blue and green. Blue yeah. is not very, not very bright at all. Whereas blue is the dimmest of the are, colors, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, it was red exactly. and green are the brightest, so yellow would be, pr would be brighter still. <laughs> And by the way, just as, as, a, as an ending note here, so we, because we really should move on to some other stuff, <laughs> yeah, um, the, these, sharp, these sharp TVs are, in fact, 3D. Uh, they come with two uh, active glasses. Uh, and interestingly, the glasses can be switched so that you're seeing 3D, just as you would, or they can be switched so that you're seeing 2D through the glasses which means that if you're watching with several people and you got these glasses on and somebody, one or more of the people you're watching with are uncomfortable watching 3D, as we know many people are, some people anyway, uh, they can switch those glasses so that they're watching it in 2D, which I thought was kind of interesting. Yeah, and obviously they have to have the glasses on or they're going to see a double image when people are yeah, watching yeah. 3D. <laughs> they, still have to watch the, they still have to have their glasses on, but they don't yep. have to watch in 3D and perhaps get uh, dizzy or nauseous or whatever. Yeah. Uh, well, anyway, uh, moving right along here, uh, SoCal Ray Jr. in the chat room asked some time ago, um, <laughs> did you see the JVC 4K projectors? <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes, we and did. And that was, that was the, other big, the other big story of the show was JVC and Sony introduced mm -hmm. 4K projectors yeah. uh, to the show. Uh, Rob, you got a chance to see those too, right? Oh, absolutely. I saw them both. And of course, I think we have to start out by pointing out the very imp uh, important distinction between yeah. the two projectors, because only one of them uh, was really native 4K, right? Right. That's exactly That's right. Yes, the JV uh, JVC uses a special technology to pixel shift. Exactly. They have a 1080p imager, which and the pixels are shifted horizontally and vertically by half a pixel. Um, uh, 120 times a second, I believe it was, uh, to yield a, a, an, an effective resolution of 3860 by 20, uh, 3840 by 2160, mm -hmm. uh, which some people call 4K and some people say, nah, that's not 4K. 4K is 4096 by 2160. Yeah, yeah well, obviously uh, it's, time dis it's time displaced by, you know, by a very instantaneous time period. By a very small the, amount, right. Two, very small amount. But another, another important thing to point out is that the Sony will accept a native 4K source if and when such a source ever becomes available, whereas the JVC will not, at least at, at present. Right, it, it, exactly. And, and that's a pretty big distinction. Uh, the, the JVC at the moment is designed only to upscale 1080p, like Blu-ray, 
uh, up to four times that resolution. And how how much how how much value that has is a, a big question to me. Mm -hmm. um, although I have to say that when they showed they showed a couple of demos at JVC, one was. Uh, some footage shot by NHK, Japan's uh, uh, national uh, broadcasting company, and they had shot that imagery at 8K. Then they had down-resed it to 1080p, and then the projector, and then they sent it to the projector, and the projector up-resed it back to 4K. Now you might think, oh man, all that down-resing and up-resing mm -hmm. would would make it look horrible, mm -hmm. but it actually looked pretty good. In fact, it looked better than the Blu-ray material that they sent. Uh, to that projector in as part of that same demo. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I remember I was I was sitting in there in one of the during one of the demos and they switched to a Blu-ray and one of the other JVC folks says, "What? Why don't you switch back to the other source?" Yeah, because <laughs> it wasn't Please. showing off the projector as well as as the as the specialized source was. <laughs> right. But, exactly. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, uh, Reverb Mike in the chat room asks, "How long before we can buy these 4K projectors?" Uh, I well, don't remember the Sony Tom, said December. Remember? Sony said December and the JVCs, I believe, uh, we're looking at November, which you can usually add a month to most of these estimates or more. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. And uh, Gaucham asks in the chat room, for reference, what do movie theaters typically project at? And the answer is 2K. Digital movie theaters now, except for movie theaters that have Sony, Sony projectors. Sony projectors do 4K now. I don't know what their, I don't know what their source files are. I'm not, I'm not certain. <laughs> well, they're that. probably server files. So I, yes. I, I'm pretty sure that you can see actual native 4K in a mm -hmm. Sony digital theater. But if it's not Sony, it's being projected at 2K. Well, that's right. And then also, as, as Tom was suggesting, at the end of the day, quite a few of the movies are still being scanned in. Uh, from negative uh, to digital in 2K. There's there, there's more 4K scanning going on than there used to be, but you're Correct. still seeing some of that happen. So. Yeah. Well, one exactly. other point too is that one other point too is that uh, I was talking to a, a technical fellow at uh, at Sony. Is that is that while while many uh, live action films are are shot either on film and, and transferred to, you know and processed in 4K during post production, a lot of special effects are still done in 2K. Oh, I didn't realize that. And that's uh, yeah, that that's actually was more so more true in the past. But but uh, mm. so the question the question is that on a big enough screen, will you see some problem with the with the melding of those two types of formats? Right. Yeah. Exactly right. And uh, Rob, I think you alluded to to a very important point here also, which is there is no 4K consumer content right now, and I don't think there's going to be for at least a couple of years. At least. No, right. not at the moment. So you know, we'll have to see what happens. But if you look at all the if you look at all the um, all the cameras that are out there right now, yeah. they're not capturing in 4K for the most part. Uh, even though there's a well, lot of the, the, the activity red, going on. The red camera is. There's a new red. Is the new right, red, the red, yeah. is the red the only one now? Uh, I don't think it's the only one. I, I'm not a big camera expert, so I, I I'm not sure. JVC has something that'll do 4K. Oh, well, it's true. In fact, at, at NAB in April, uh, JVC was showing a 4K camera, and I know Sony has a 4K camera. Mm -hmm. They do, but, uh, but from a yeah. from a production standpoint and the and from a practical matter, you know, these cameras have to basically get to a point where they're cheap enough that production companies can basically <laughs> rent them out and actually use them. And if they don't yeah. have a good reason to, because there aren't a lot of 4K displays out there. Right. And they're not going to spend that money. So well, it was it's kind of a chicken notes. and egg problem. Sorry, Tom, go ahead. I was going through my notes uh, this morning, and I, there was an interesting line scribble on the bottom of my this page with the Sony. And apparently it was a line that was uttered by one of the uh, Sony uh, reps that was giving a, you know, the, the spiel at their press event. And he said that the, the line I wrote down was, with a new, a, a, new, a new line, I think he means future, new line of 4K-enabled products. So I don't know yes. if he did he wasn't referring specifically to that projector. He's referring to, to some future stuff that they hope that they can use to support that projector. Uh, exactly. I would also I would also comment as Rob just said, uh, you're not going to get support for from the studios for 4K program material unless there's a lot of 4K displays out there, and that doesn't mean Sony and uh, JVC projectors. That means flat panels. And we exactly. haven't seen that movement. We haven't seen anything, any movement to that yet. And and how much difference 4K will make on a 50 or 60 inch flat panel, we'll have to wait and see. <laughs> it's a very good point, an excellent point. The smaller the screen size, of course, the less important that extended resolution is. Although that brings up the next point I wanted to mention, which was uh, in the Onkyo Integra booth, 
they were showing their uh, audio video receivers and pre preamp processors that can upscale 1080p to 4K, and they were showing it on, I believe it was a 60 or 65 inch plasma with no nameplate. It was a 4K <laughs> plasma. <laughs> Yeah. But we didn't know who made it because they yeah. wouldn't tell us. <laughs> well, the the interesting point is if, you, if you've got if you've got native 4K source, and you want to compare what it'll look like on a 2K versus a 4K display, or on a if you've got a 4K display and you want to feed it both a 2K and a 4K version of the same source, say, mm -hmm. to see what the difference is, you can't mm -hmm. because the 2K source, in order to fill that the pixels on that panel, is going to have to be up converted to 4K. So all you you can compare what native 4K versus 2K upconverted to 4K, but you can't just you can't see you can't see that 2K source on that panel unless you want to accept an image that only fills part of the screen. Right, exactly <laughs> right. Beatmaster in the chat room is asking, did we get to see the new Philips 235 to one TV? Uh, yeah, and the answer, the answer is no, no, because Philips wasn't Philips there. Wasn't However, there. neither was Vizio. <laughs> Neither was Vizio, which is also going to be bringing out a 235 TV. Yeah. But we did see two 235 to 1 projectors. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, well, actually, and those, I, are, yeah. those are with native, native mm -hmm. 235 to 1 imagers, DLP imagers from Texas Instruments. Uh, the projectors were from Sim2 and mm -hmm. Digital Projection. Did you guys see those? Uh, didn't see them in action, but I know I know Sim Two during the press event they weren't they weren't demonstrating that, so I don't know if no, they were. No, they weren't. Or That's not. true. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Um, J, uh, digital projection was in their in their huge booth. Yeah. Technically um, speaking, technically, technically speaking, you can do the same thing on the Sony 4K projector. If, I'm not sure if it has a mode for that. I wasn't. I didn't get any clarity about that. They said it. They said it would support two, three, five, but I didn't know if they meant on that chip on the 4K chip or using an anamorphic lens. Right. Uh, Midnight Rider asks, uh, how did the picture look on the 4K projectors? That, you guys well, want to comment it, it, on that? Well, you already commented on the JVC, I believe, didn't you, Scott, when you talked about yeah, the Yeah, I switching? did. I thought that the yeah. uh, 8K yeah. sourced material yeah. looked better than actual Blu-ray. Yeah, yeah. But uh, on, the, on, the, on the Sony, yes, it looked, it looked pretty good. There were, there were some issues with it that we, I guess, determined later were due to, well, at least according to Sony, and it makes sense. So a lot of, there was a lot of processing going on behind the scenes before it got to that projector. They had to because they were, they were, mixing, they were mixing native 4K material with, uh, with uh, Blu-ray material that was up-converted to 4K, and mm -hmm. uh, apparently there's a lot of complex stuff going on that caused, that caused some, uh, some false contouring on the screen. But, uh, lots, apart, of, lots of false yes, contouring. Yeah. Yeah. Apart from that, I mean, as far as as far as detail and color, it, it looked it looked terrific. But uh, of course, the the issue at the show, as I mentioned in one of my blogs, you know, people always want to know what was the best picture at the show. How can you know? Every every manufacturer is using a different screen, different screen material, different program material, different size screen. So there's there's no way you can make that comparison or show up. So you can you, you can you can comment as to whether something really looked good, but you can't say if say that the JVC looked better than the Sony or vice versa. Right, right. I think I think it is safe to say though that as a general trend, there were an awful lot of great looking projectors at yes, this show. Yes. Many of no, them at almost kidding. ridiculously low price mm -hmm. points and, and I have to bring up the Epson. Yes, uh, I was hoping which, somebody would. I was going yes. to not you. <laughs> really, <laughs> just and and yes. I have to thank my colleague Tom Norton because it was the very last half hour of the very last <laughs> day of the show, and I still had not seen the demo. And I strolled <laughs> by Epson. They had a line that was going so far around the booth that clearly the people in the end were not <laughs> going to get into this. <laughs> And Tom was like one of the first four or five people in the line. He he basically said, "Do you want to do, take my spot on this line?" And yeah, as a consequence, <laughs> I got to see one of the great. great I, I wasn't uh, being demos that generous. I, I had already seen. I had already seen it once. I, it was the end of the day, and I thought, "Well, I'll go over there and see the see well, the well, see the action right. again." So. <laughs> and, and, and I would point out that the fact that you had gone back to see it again uh, yeah. really speaks to how really what a great volumes. demo it was. They have well, a actually, new actually, actually, technology. I, yeah, I actually had an ulterior motive. I had a couple of my own pieces of of of, uh, of source material on there, and I figured, well, if it was really slow at the end of the last day, and they were just ah, you know yeah. uh, you know looking for people, and it was the room was empty, I'd ask uh, who, if, if Greg Lewin, who was running it earlier, I, I, was Greg Lewin running it when you were there, Rob? Do you know? Uh, I believe it was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. If if he would pop my 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 material on, but then when I saw the line, I realized that wasn't going to happen. So. <laughs> right. Well, I'm really glad, Rob, you got to see it because I did too, and th that thing blew me away. That is a 1080p projector. It's Epson's first uh, excursion into LCOS technology, reflective LCD, um, and and it costs under five thousand dollars. Yeah, under must, five thousand dollars with an extra lamp. With an extra lamp, for and, God's and, sake, and, and, and a ceiling and, 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 and a ceiling mount, a chief ceiling right. mount. 
It so must be said, however, that it must be said, however, it is 2D only, not, not 3D. That's, correct. That's, that's correct. important. To know. I mean, that yes, doesn't matter exactly. to a lot of folks, but people need to know that. Yeah. Well, right. I think what's, what's interesting about it, and, and Tom, maybe you were able to get into a little bit more detail about what they're doing with their LCOS that is different. I mean, we should point out for listeners that this is not the Sony chip. This is no. not a JVC chip. This is Epson's own iteration mm -hmm. of LCOS. One of the reasons that this projector was delayed was because they needed the extra time to kind of get the chip right. And right. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what they're doing, but it really looks spectacular. I also didn't ask the question, and maybe you did, Tom, about whether this projector had a uh, had had an aperture uh, on. Not, it. it has a dynamic iris, but it was being demonstrated with it off. According mm -hmm. to Rachel, okay, well, for a native picture, those. that was awfully good. That was a really exactly. Good I mean, the black level was stunning, just stunning, mm -hmm. and the uh, shadow detail I thought was really, really great too. And and Greg chose some great clips. By the way, I should yeah. say that Greg Lowen. Uh, has mm -hmm. been a guest on the podcast. I'm sure I'll bring him back. Uh, he's a great calibrator, THX certified, and in fact, a THX instructor. Um, and he was hired by Epson to demonstrate this projector. So we knew that it was set up properly and, mm -hmm. and working properly because he really knows what he's doing. So They had, uh, they had a 10-foot wide screen, and he claimed, and uh, I would trust him, that, that they were getting 17-foot Lamberts on that screen. In the high lamp mode, but that's a 10-foot In high lamp wide. mode, yeah. And, and the black levels, screen. he said, were um, immeasurable. Yep. And, and I could believe it. It was a ten foot wide. It was ten foot wide, two, three, five to one screen, and they were, they were, they were doing the zoom on the material that needed it. You know, oh yeah, and that's the other thing about that projector yes, that's yes. so cool. It's yes. got lens memories. Right. Uh, you can you can zoom in and refocus and and reposition the um, uh, horizontal and vertical lens shift for two, three, five, and then set it set it differently for 16 by 9 and then just call those up with a with the touch of a button and they go mm -hmm. back to the to the right spots spot on as opposed That's, to say the panasonic which i've heard tends yeah. to drift shall we say well the panasonic i mean the, the both the jv we should mention that the new jvcs all have lens shift too uh, focus zoom and lens shift uh, now, in terms of lens memory they'll they'll memorize yes. those that lens oh, okay. memory, even even the cheapest one, and that's that's another point we should we shouldn't depart without saying. And the JVC, their least expensive projector uh, this year, which was a, a follow-on to last year's forty-five hundred dollar model, is now thirty-five hundred dollars and has the the lens shift and a full co uh, color management system, mm -hmm. and three D, and three D. Of course, yes, three D. Yeah, but right, the yeah the the uh, both the Epson and the JVCs have have you know a focus zoom and lens shift horizontal and vertical. I believe they all have. Uh, but the Panasonic has focus and zoom, but I was told that the Panasonic, uh, we went to a press event, does not have lens shift on the memory, which is, can be a problem because zoom usually shifts the, shifts the, uh, the lens just slightly up or down sometimes. Exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, Rob, were you, did you have something you were going to add there? Uh, no, uh, no. Oh, okay. Not really. <laughs> I was just going to, I was just going to then uh, quickly go into 3D because I got a question in the chat room about whether or not we saw the Sony head mount display, the yes. <laughs> HMZ T1 OLED uh, headset. Now, somebody else in the chat room had asked earlier, did we, did we see any OLED displays? And the answer is yes, this is the only one. This is it. And, <laughs> and, and, and what it is, is it's a tiny, it's, a, it's a, like a visor, sort of like a Star Trek Geordi LaForge's visor, <laughs> you know, that fits over your eyes. And it's got two 720p tiny little OLED screens, one for each eye, mm -hmm. and a pair of headphones that's flipped down over your ears, and gives you 3D, uh, mm -hmm. uh, really superb looking 3D, yeah. I thought. Yeah. And, then, and well, since it's OLED, it, it will go totally black. Exactly. OLED, 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 OLEDs actually better than any other technology. It doesn't need any local dimming or any anything else special to go completely black. Right, uh, right. Rob, did I, you I, see I that, that, that mount display? Oh, sorry, oh, sorry, Tom. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah, no, I did. I did check it out, and you know, yeah. I have to point out that you know this is not the first time that we've seen virtual uh, widescreen yeah. glasses before, but I think the first time we've seen them in high definition. Uh, yeah. First time that really worked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right, and, and and it did work. I, I have to say though, I'm still a little bit skeptical about uh, that particular product. Now I don't remember. Did one of you guys catch the price point on that? Because that's, that's yeah, I think it was around discussion. seven. I think it was seven hundred dollars, something like that. I, I think it was eight, seven or eight hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah. Not a, seven not or eight hundred dollars. Yeah. No. Now look, very very cool. I have to say, but here's the yeah. problem that I saw with it. It is not a portable. When you can get that thing, oh. that thing has a little yeah. black box that the HDMI yes. cable plugs into, and it does all True the processing. Enough. 
and yeah. sends it off and it has to be plugged into a wall outlet. Now, yeah. if you can, when they figure out how to do that, where you can just plug into your iPad or, you know, or not necessarily your iPad, but your computer, wherever you happen to have your files stored, or for that matter, put a flash drive into uh, the thing and be able to watch a movie uh, mm-hmm. and get good sound and audio over the earphones, which was the other weakness of it. The sound was not very good. Then yeah, I, think so I, got, I thought the sound was pretty poor. They, 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 did, they did say you can, you can move those ear pieces out of the way and use uh, earbuds if you want to, better quality earbuds. Yeah, they phones. need to do something with that. But, but still, I yeah. The, the, I mean, this is a, this is the the very beginning of a technology yeah. that no I suspect. About it. Yeah. You can't go. It's you can't go jogging with it yet. No, <laughs> and, it's, and, and, and honestly, it's good to see it back. I imagine there will be those people who, for whatever reason, feel a, a need to have that in their home. Uh, yeah. But aside from a gaming experience and a more intimate gaming experience, I'm not sure exactly. You know, when you prefer to do that versus say a. Uh, uh, you know, watching your big screen well, TV at well, home. Well, for game, I can see a real problem with gaming because when you when you move your head with it, you get some really weird. The whole image shifts and tilts and does it with your head. So oh, if right. you're gaming okay. and you're getting really active, it's it's going to be almost impossible to watch the thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah especially when you can. When I noticed when I moved my head around, uh, yeah. I could see the floor out of the bottom of the yeah. visor. Yeah. And when you move your head around and you watch and you can see in your peripheral vision how the floor is moving and the screen is kind of moving, this quote-unquote yeah. yeah. screen that you're watching yeah. is moving in relation to it. I mean, yeah. I could easily see getting totally sick over that. <laughs> yeah. well, plus the fact that it is, it is, I mean, it's not exactly light. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's fairly, not. Fairly I mean, it's, it's designed to hopefully rest on, uh, with, a, with a pad that rests on your forehead instead of having it rest on your nose because it weighs a couple of pounds. Yeah, and, exactly. Uh, but but mm-hmm. uh, I could see it being, you know, that being quite a negative. I mean, somebody put, trying it on in the store and, 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 and just, you know, tossing it across the room. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, the fellow that was demonstrating said, oh, it's no problem. I've watched a two-hour movie on it. Well, that's something I'd want to try before I paid $800 for it to see if I could tolerate yeah. it for more than a half an hour. <laughs> Yeah, exactly right. I, exactly. I, right. Also, Sorry, I also don't think I'd want to use it in front of my kids because they would take one look at me and go, what a loser. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Plus, who knows what they'd be doing while you're it's watching like, that. Exactly. <laughs> I, know, I know Dad's a geek, but now it's over the top. But, you know, anyway. <laughs> well, speaking so. of 3D, there was a lot of it there, of course. Yeah. Um, we saw projectors from Panasonic, digital projection, JVC. Uh, Epson had a 3D projector, not the reflect, reflective Elcos one we were talking about. Mitsubishi. Um, Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi had a new low-cost uh, projector. Did any of you guys get a chance to just stick your eyes on the uh, on the glasses that were being used for that projector demo? I don't no, know I, I didn't get, get to the there. Mitsubishi booth. I think, Tom, you did. I, I, got, I, got, I got to it. They, they had the glasses mounted on, on these uh, stands so you didn't <laughs> yeah. have to put them on your... These new, yeah. These oh, yeah, Panasonic does that, too. Panasonic does that, too. Yeah, the, I the only the only interesting issue on the on the uh, on the Mitsubishi 3D is that I, I was asking around. I was trying desperately to find somebody in the booth that knew anything about the gain of the screen, mm-hmm. uh, and I couldn't find anybody that really knew. Uh, but there was a little sign that said it was a it was a Butec, uh, uh Silver Star screen, and uh, there was nothing about the gain there. But uh, I, I went back later and, and looked up Silver Star on the uh, Butec website, and that has a gain of six. <laughs> a gain of yes, six. It, it, was a very bright, it was a very bright 3D image. <laughs> By the way, just for listeners who are who might not under, might not know the term gain, typically on a uh, on a home theater screen, you have a gain of 1.3 or so, typically. So a gain of six means that it's it's reflecting light back in a very narrow cone, all right back at you, and it's extremely bright, which is important for 3D. You want much more light coming at you in 3D because the glasses remove so much of it from from reaching your eyes. So, uh, but, but six is kind of ridiculous. Room. Yeah, I mean, you would have noticed that if it had been a wider room, you had a chance yeah, to get left or right screen. You couldn't, get, screen, you couldn't you get far enough off axis. Yeah, right. Yeah, uh, the I will say, I I will say that though. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I, will go ahead about the, I will say I will say that about the Pioneer is that in the Pioneer was in a ver- when we were talking about the Elite. We'll go back to that again, but it was in a very wide room, so we could get off axis and see what was going on. So yeah, yeah exactly. They weren't, they weren't afraid of nothing there with yeah, that TV. Yeah, but, yeah uh, no kidding. <laughs> yeah, no. The, the reason I mentioned the mitts is because you know you were talking earlier, Scott, about uh, people who have uh, some issues with watching 3D, and I happen to be one of those people who is more sensitive to active glasses, passive really? glasses. Are, are less disturbing to me. The shutter effect of active glasses, depending upon the execution, can can make it difficult for me to watch 3D. And I am very sensitive to it. 
And one of the interesting things about that Mitsubishi projector is that uh, they have a new generation of glasses on that projector that is, I believe they said thinner, but certainly faster. And I really felt that I could notice the difference. Uh, when I was watching, when I put my eyes on those glasses, mm. I felt more comfortable, less fatigued than I typically feel as my eyes are usually adjusting to active mm. glasses. Wow, um, wow. So uh, it sort of suggested to me that maybe one of the hidden trends of the show is that uh, perhaps we're starting to see now some uh, advances in the glasses and, uh, you know, they're trying to get, if nothing else, the, the blanking intervals down to where you're having less trouble with them, but they're making the glasses quicker. That's good. So Right. Now, uh, Rob, given that, did you, uh, did you see the Runco or Sim 2 3D projectors? Because those no, use passive no, glasses. I miss those. I miss okay. those, but I will tell you that the passive glasses, uh, demos and what they had some very interesting demos over at the DPI booth where they had projectors uh, that were identical that were set up with both passive and active because both yes. their, their projectors will accommodate both yes. and uh, you know of course you're not dealing the one beautiful thing about passive glasses in a front projection situation like that is that you're not dealing with the lines that we see that separates the left and right image uh, on an LCD Correct. passive right. so so you don't get any of that and I'm definitely I preferred the passive from a comfort level. I did too. Uh, I, do, I went to that same demo and I, I had the right? exact same response. Yep. Right. However, uh, one of the things that was pointed out to me, and I had to admit it was true, is that the active glasses demo, for whatever reason, was brighter and a little bit more <laughs> dynamic. So it's like, hmm. well, you know, you seem to just sacrifice something no matter what you do. Yeah. Tom, did you have something to add there? Yeah, no, that's it. That was, uh, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> just one more point uh, before we move on, uh, which is I, I have to point this out. The Runco, uh, it knew that they have a new top-end, super expensive 3D projector with using two engines, two projection engines. Uh, they were firing onto a hundred and some inch screen, um, and they claim to be getting a peak white on that screen of a hundred foot Lamberts. Now, that would be 2D, uh, though, right? In 2D, uh, sure. In 2D, yeah. But still, yeah. Um, in a movie theater, you want 14 to 16. And they were getting 100. Um, <laughs> and and, and just, just to put things into perspective, that projector starts at $200,000. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, um, anyway, um, <clears throat> I'd like to move on to audio. But before we do... I do want to take a moment to thank our uh, sponsor for this episode of Home Theater Geeks, which is Netflix. Uh, as we all know, of course, Netflix streams thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to you instantly, uh, which saves you time, money, and hassle. You can watch uh, these movies and TV shows on your Mac or PC, even your iPad. Gotta love that iPad app. Uh, you can even watch it on your iPhone uh, and some Android phones as well. If you have a gaming console, an Xbox 360, PS3, Nintendo Wii, um, you can even watch uh, Netflix from those. Most TVs now come with uh, Netflix if they have online apps and uh, Blu-ray players as well. So there's so many different ways to get Netflix, um, and you can watch it. You can watch these TV shows and movies instantly uh, from any of these devices. You can even begin watching on one device and finish on another. Whichever way you choose, uh, you can watch these uh, movies and TV shows as many times as you want, uh, any place, any time. So uh, for a free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. And be sure to use this URL when you sign up for the free trial. Netflix.com slash twit. And we thank their... Uh, them for their support of Twit, and we hope that you enjoy watching instantly on your TV at home. <clears throat> so, um, getting back to the Cedia show, uh, I wanted to turn our attention to audio. We have about uh, 15 minutes left, and we kind of maxed out on a video there, but I didn't want to leave audio out because there was a, some interesting things in the audio realm being introduced there as well. I think probably one of the most interesting was the Atlantic Technology Sound Bar. Wouldn't you guys agree? Yeah, I'd say so. Yep. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, Atlantic Technology, two years ago at Cedia in Atlanta, showed us this new technology that had been developed by a company called Solus Clements, called HPASS, uh, High Pressure Acceleration System. It's basically a, a kind of a loading system on woofers, on speaker drivers, that allow them to go much lower 
than they otherwise would be able to do. And the point of this sound bar was to you, they're using four inch drivers, Tom, is that correct? Yes, four inch woofers yeah. and, and, a, and tweeter. Um, and a, like tweeter. one inch tweeters, small tweeters. Yeah. But the four yeah. inch woofers with this H pass uh, loading, cabinet loading, was able to get down to, they claimed, 47 hertz at minus 3 dB, which is very, very low. Um, now, Tom, I heard it only in the hotel demo, and it, it, was, it sounded pretty good. It was pretty amazing. You heard it in a sound room and thought it sounded better, right? Well, so it, yeah, much better. I mean, it, it sounded it sounded fine fine on music in the uh, demo in the hotel room, mm -hmm. but uh, but I thought the uh, the uh, the movie playback was so bright as, as to be unlistenable. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, but I didn't notice I didn't notice anywhere near that problem in their in their own demo room. So so they either fixed something or the the acoustics helped a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Rob, did you, did you get to hear it? I I hope you did. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. It's very impressive. It's uh, you know. At the end of the day, if you're not able to add a subwoofer to your operation, yeah. because obviously, yeah. you know, it does yeah. the same thing, uh, yeah. there's something to be said about the wife acceptance factor of a product that actually <laughs> yes. gives you a nice modicum yeah. of bass without yeah. having to have a little box yeah. out in the room. Yeah. Not, right. to mention, not to mention the yeah. wires yeah. that are required to get that box to where yeah. it sounds best. So, um, right, right. Well, I'm, right, I'm, exactly. I'm, I'm, still, I'm still not. I'm still not totally convinced that a that a that a that a, that a decent uh, and you know bookshelf speaker on stands to the left and right in the speaker just operating in two channel with a with a modest receiver won't give you deeper bass. I'll, that, well, that that the jury's out on that. Uh, but uh, basically, what that that combination though, uh, even a modest receiver and a uh, and a decent pair of uh, bookshelf speakers is probably going to run you close to a thousand dollars or more. So we're talking six hundred dollars for the Atlantic soundbar. Sure. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Now that's I, some, interesting. Sorry, go ahead, Rob. No, I was just go ahead, go ahead, uh, Scott. I was just going to say that the price point of that sound bar, five or six hundred bucks, is what uh, what they told us, mm -hmm. uh, is a little expensive for an active sound bar, and it is an active sound bar. Yeah. It has its own amplifiers built in, and it will simulate a three point one or three channel or five channel surround uh, using DSP and so on. Um, uh, with its and it'll decode, I think uh, Dolby Digital and DTS and so on, won't it? I'm yes. pretty sure it they, will. They, they didn't. They didn't have. They didn't have the DTS in opera. Uh, That's right. Operating. They don't have that done yet. We, we were looking. Yes. At, we were listening to a prototype. Yes, I, I brought. I brought a piece of my own material along. At, 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 uh, one day he let me do it, do it early in the morning before he started his demo and uh, opening time around nine o'clock and uh, mm -hmm. I popped that on the dip. But it turned out that was DTS HD Master Audio. So it wouldn't play that properly, so we had to switch to the French Dolby Digital track. <laughs> <laughs> Just to hear what it sounded like. Yes, yeah. Exactly. Um, well, that was, a, that was very impressive. The, another very impressive thing that I know all three of you guys heard uh, was the uh, PSB headphones. Yes. Now, PSB is well known for speakers. I have them in my own home theater. Uh, mm -hmm. Paul Barton, uh, the P and the B of PSB, um, I assume his middle initial is S, I guess, um, uh, decided to get into headphones. And these are actually noise-canceling headphones. And uh, I was super impressed with that sound. Weren't you, Rob? Yeah, I think they sounded very, very good. The, um, yeah, and really, you're hitting upon something that I think is, from an audio standpoint, one of the major trends of the show. If you looked around, aside from the fact that there were a lot of nice new receivers out and uh, some very nice high-end pre-pros and things like that, the big, big action was in personal audio. Uh, mm -hmm. Big major companies like PSB that really know great sound getting into personal audio in one way or another with new iPod docks, which PSB also had a $600 iPod dock, actually a $700 iPod dock. Uh, that sounded really fabulous that Paul Barton was involved in developing. And, yeah, oh, it uh, sounded great. Absolutely. Sure. So that was, it was very interesting between USB DACs that were appearing it's seemingly everywhere, uh, media servers. For, for people who want to take uh, stuff offline and, and uh, get it in a high-quality way to their, their good speakers. Uh, and then headphones, you know, that's where a lot of the action was for audio this time around. Yeah. yeah I, also, I, I, yeah, asked, I also like... Oh, go ahead. Sorry, go, go ahead, Tom. Oh, I was, I'd also like to point out that uh, as good as the, uh, the, uh, the PSP headphones sounded, <clears throat> they were being driven by a very modest... Uh, amplifier, which was, I guess, it was an amplifier that kind of would, would drive four sets of headphones from Behringer. Yeah, a headphone, headphone splitter amplifier. Splitter I think you, amplifier. you told me yeah, that. It was, 
Yeah, yeah, it's called the Microamp HA400. It's from Behringer, and uh, it uh, it sells for the uh, outrageous sum of twenty-two dollars on my parts express card. <laughs> so it clearly was oh. not compromising the sound, at least not what we heard. <laughs> yeah, no, it's clearly not. Um, yeah. Uh, by the way, I just uh, one guy in the chat room, getting back to projectors for just a second, said said I purchased an Epson 9700 this weekend, but the installer has not delivered it yet. Should I have waited for the new Epson projector that you discussed? <laughs> I think uh, uh, it's hard to say. Now, the 9700 is being replaced by the 6010, yes, which we saw 3D, work yeah. in 3D mode, and it looked pretty good in 3D mode, I thought, but this, yep. this new reflection, uh, I forget, it's a 61000, I believe, is the model number. Yes, uh, Holy smokes, that thing was just amazing. I'm, I'm, so, I'm, sure that is, I'm sure that's more expensive than the one he's getting. Uh, I don't know what yeah. the product is. The top price of Epson's uh, LCDs is usually under th under four thousand dollars. In fact, that that new sixty ten that you mentioned, they said they didn't give an exact price, but they said it should be under four thousand dollars. And it has the same deal: a spare spare bulb and uh, and a, a chief ceiling mount and mm. two sets of three D glasses. Right. Keep yeah. in mind that the big difference between those two still remains the fact that one of them will do three D and the other one will not. So yes, right. Yeah. 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 Right. At a cheaper exactly. price. Epson, interestingly enough, Epson was, I'll give them a plug because they were up there in both room. They were, they were advertising their, their warranty, which is three years regardless of the hours. Okay. So it's not uh, three yes, years most... or 2,000 hours. Right. <laughs> right. Which is pretty cool. Yep. Um, and plus, plus, even one bad pixel, they will exchange the exchange. They'll the exchange thing. the whole projector. Yeah. They, yep. It's, it's yep. quite remarkable. Um, getting back to audio, uh, another thing I wanted to make sure we, we mentioned at least is the uh, new Golden Ear. Uh, bookshelf speakers. Yep. Mm -hmm. Now, Rob, you and I were in the room at the same time when we when I first heard it, and you, I guess, you did too. Uh, this is Sandy Gross's company, and and his um, his new his speakers that he's developed up till now, little satellites, and then also towers, uh, have just impressed the heck out of out of everybody who's heard them, and these were no exception, weren't they? No, absolutely. In fact, that's yet another trend really at the show because you had a number of manufacturers that were sort of introducing high quality, high performance bookshelf speakers uh, for not too, too much money. Uh, and Def, Def Tech also had uh, some great new bookshelf speakers out that were very mm -hmm. expensive. And very, do, you remember, very do you remember what the Eon? Do you remember what the Aeons uh, were going for? I don't remember the price point. You no, know, I don't. I don't remember the price point. But they weren't really over the top at all, and uh, a really, really unique sound. I think Scott, you and I were both very impressed with, the, in particular, the imaging of that speaker. Um, yeah, exactly it, right. It, it, it also produced a, a, a pretty good amount of bass, uh, you know, for such a tiny little speaker the way they had it set up. Mm -hmm. But uh, more than anything, I thought that the imaging was just pinpoint spectacular and deep, 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 which is always very, you know, makes for a very, very convincing audiophile experience. Yeah, so. yeah. On, on the, on the, on the uh, audio front, I'd also like to put a plug in for some new speakers from Definitive Technology, and I'm not saying this be... Because uh, you know, full disclosure, we went to dinner with them. Uh, <laughs> yes, we had a very nice Italian. We had a very nice Italian, nice dinner, Italian dinner with Definitive dinner. Technology. Yeah. But, but, uh, uh, but you know, tell, the, tell us about the speakers that uh, you're, no, you're they, thinking. They, they're, 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 they're called the Studio Monitor Series. Their bookshelf. There's three different models, and uh, the one we heard at the show was uh, was the uh, SM55. This won't be out for a few months yet. Uh, Five ninety nine a pair. They are playing them in stereo. Though interestingly enough, I, I had forgotten to write down what the uh, what the uh, the electronics was being used, what electronics were being used to drive them. Oh, <laughs> and it was I, good I, stuff. I, I, it was very, very I, good well, stuff. Yeah, I emailed, I emailed Paul, Paul DeComo this morning, and he said that it had uh, pass power amp and pass preamp audio research CD player, and uh, you were probably looking at a, uh, at, a uh, <laughs> at a system front end that costs like, you know, ten to fifteen thousand dollars, and I wrote back and I said, "No wonder they sounded so good." <laughs> they, they, really, they really did sound sweet, and I have to say, they probably generated more bass in that room, and it was a yeah. larger room, I think, than than uh, the Golden Ear yeah. room was, uh, mm -hmm. than Golden Ears were able to do. Uh, but um, it, it really was uh, a very impressive sound for a five, you know, six hundred dollar pair. Yeah loudspeaker. They had a, those speakers are designed with a passive radiator surface on top of the speaker. There's mm -hmm. actually a grill where you would normally put your cocktail, of course. You know, <laughs> you'll have to figure something else out for that, but uh, yeah, right. they, they've gotten more radiating area out of it because oh. they've, they've used that. So uh, That's, that's yeah. probably how they got the, got the base down where, where it is. Huh? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I, noticed, I, noticed it was, I noticed it was a passive radiator in the specs, but I just I didn't, I hadn't heard that it was on top. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. There's actually a grill. In fact, I had Paul uh, remove the uh, remove the grill for me so I could take a look at it. So you'll have to, again, um, you'll, you'll have to put a little sign on the top. Do not set your classes here. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, right. There's their their new super cute woofers also sounded great. So. Yeah, they were they were actually using that on one of the one of the uh, one of the demo selections, and uh, I, I had the unique experience of uh, when they played uh, some really deep bass through the uh, subwoofer, the uh, bright speaker on the stand fell off. <laughs> 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 Did you get a picture? No, it happened too fast. I, he, he all put it back so quickly that I didn't get a chance to run up and take a shot of it without you know on, laying on the floor. <laughs> now a couple of couple people in the chat room have asked are asking if we saw the Lexicon MP20, their new Lexicon's new surround processor. I didn't get to see it, Tom. I think you did. I, I saw it. I didn't get to hear it. I mean, it's uh, they weren't it looks, playing it, were they? I, I might have been playing in the JBL room, which I didn't get into. They were running the synthesis system. I'm not sure if they were using that or if they were using the JBL front ends, which they probably were. The, the synthesis system has, I think, has dedicated uh, dedicated front end electronics, which mm -hmm. is probably made by Lexicon but not labeled Lexicon. But yeah, right. it's 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 looks it looks quite impressive with a lot of a lot of capabilities. It has a, a new built-in processing uh, called Quantum Logic, which we really don't have time to go into now, but uh, you'll be hearing more about that in the future. Uh, but it's going to be quite expensive. They can't. Didn't quite a quote a price, but I would say that uh, not much south of twenty thousand dollars would be a good guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Bryston also had a terrific new pre pro that they came out with. It's more of a uh, an audiophile purist approach, where basically they're doing HDMI inputs for video switching, but no video processing on board to keep things nice and clean, and also to keep it future proof. Uh, mm -hmm. And that 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 is also a very nice piece. That's ninety five hundred dollars. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I'd also like to point out for uh, for audio files that go back a little ways is that uh, a company called Indie Audio Labs or something like that uh, near near Indianapolis is bringing back the Aragon Accurus amplifiers, which were oh. very popular audio file amps in the mid '90s. Yeah, that's great. With the original styling, actually, yes. uh, with the notch yes. and the. Uh, the but unfortunately, not the original price. <laughs> 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 the originals were, I think, two grand. These are four grand for the stereo amp. They have model blocks also. So right. that's for the right. that's for the that's for the Aragon. The Acuras are at least less expensive. Well, listen, guys, uh, it's been a great uh, a great show here. I'm really sorry that our time is already up. Can you believe it? <laughs> the uh, the show goes by very fast, and we had so much to cover, and we didn't get to all of it certainly. But uh, I, I think we gave everybody a pretty good flavor of. Uh, of of what it was, yeah. We 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 were there for three days, and uh, yeah. you know we have an hour to cover it up. But um, I want to thank you both, uh, Rob Sabin, editor of Home Theater Magazine, and Tom Norton, the senior editor of Home Theater Magazine, and uh, also both contributing on HomeTheater.com, of course. Uh, and you can get Home Theater Magazine on newsstands everywhere, and read our stuff on HomeTheater.com. Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot, Scott. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, really good. Really good. Uh, listen, uh, everyone, you can email me at scott at twit.tv, and you can follow me on Twitter at htgeekscott. Now, next week, I'm working on a very special guest. I, I think it's going to happen, and so I'm going to tell you about it, and I hope that it doesn't fall through. But uh, if it does happen, my very special guest geek is scheduled to be John Dykstra an Oscar-winning special effects supervisor on movies such as Star Wars 4, Batman Forever, Spider-Man 1 and 2, Inglorious Bastards, and most recently, X-Men First Class. So, uh, assuming that I work that all out and it's looking good, uh, that is going to be one heck, of, one heck of a show. So, I sure hope you will join me for that. Until then, geek out. <laughs>